Let's get this started. It is the 200 level. Mike Carpenter here on a Monday afternoon, and Illinois is in the Sweet 16. I thought that it would feel better the day after than it did the night of, just because the full weight and gravity of not having made Sweet 16s would truly be lifted. And that was the case. Sunday was great. Even though the game stunk in the NCAA tournament, there's something about waking up and remembering, oh, right, we won last night. And we get a whole nother week to get ready for another Illini game, to really try to put the season into the proper context. And on this Monday afternoon, that's what I'm going to try to do, is just sort of look at the season as a whole. Look, of course, ahead to the Iowa State game, and then hopefully uh, in a week eight game, if you can make it through Thursday, But before we get to that, it's really just sort of soaking in what this is and why it is so meaningful for Illinois fans. And listen, 37 years old, I've I've been fortunate to experience a lot of good Illini basketball seasons. And for me, the best stretch, of course, was from 1998 through 2006. Now, I include 1998 in there because there was a Big Ten title. And then in 99, you had the Big Ten tournament run. 2000, you were a 4 or 5 seed with Lon Kruger, didn't win a Big Ten title, but that was really the seeds being sown for what Bill Self did the next few years, which included two Big Ten titles, an Elite Eight, Sweet 16, great recruiting classes that set you up for Bruce Weber's early success. It was a run of about eight seasons where you were just really, really, really good. And here we are in year seven of Brad Underwood, and things are clicking in a way that they have not been clicking for 20 years. And you saw the culmination of that on Saturday night where, you know, Duquesne is not a a team that we're going to remember much about, but it wasn't about Duquesne. That night was about Illinois, regardless of who the opponent was. It could have been BYU. And I still think you would have won by double digits. The way that you played, you were not losing to many teams in the country on Saturday night. It just so happened. You were playing the sixth place team from the Atlantic 10 that was just completely overmatched. It wasn't all that dissimilar from what we saw yesterday with UConn and Northwestern. Now, Northwestern, a better team than Duquesne, we would say, though they've been a little bit hobbled by injuries. But that was a team just asserting their will. So it was kind of encouraging to see Illinois do that. Not kind of, but very encouraging to see them do that. And say, you know what? We are in the bracket with an Iowa State and a UConn. And even last year's runner-up, San Diego State, we're in that bracket, but we might still have a chance. And I think they do. I don't know how great of a chance. But what I do know is that going into this weekend, while of course I want to win, and of course when the game starts on Thursday, I'm going to want to win that much more just because you're in it, you're watching it. The pressure of 19 years of not having made the second weekend is gone. And that means that Thursday when we turn the TV on super late, yes, admittedly, it is going to be a late game, Adrenaline will get us through, don't worry. I I will want to win, but I won't be pulling my hair out or have quite the pit in the stomach that I did even before the Duquesne game. Damn, I thought it was hard enough waiting until 749 or whenever that game tipped off. I can't imagine 909 on Thursday, but it will be easier in a way because you checked off that box, as Brad Underwood has said. And that's what it is. It's checking a box. He said things to the effect on Saturday that it's just a crime that this program hadn't been to a Sweet 16 in 19 years. I think we'd all agree with that. This program is too good to go damn near two decades not making at least Sweet 16s. So how many years in a row has it been now? Three. Since the Loyola game, think about this. Of course, Big Ten titles would be great, and they got one in 2022. Big Ten tournament title this year, that's great. Hang a banner. I'm excited for it. But before every season, the course was... Sweet 16 or bust. Sweet 16 or bust. And now you did it. And that last little remnant for Brad Underwood, but even more than that, that last remnant for us as Illini fans, you've addressed it. You can win in March. You can get breaks in March. It's been a while since we got one of those, so don't feel bad that we beat Duquesne. We've had to play plenty of great teams in the second weekend, or second round, excuse me. No, this was just sort of something that unfolded very naturally from Selection Sunday until now, and you took advantage of it, but not only did you take advantage of it, you did so in emphatic fashion on Saturday with a performance that is as dominant as any NCAA tournament performance that I can remember as an Illini fan. The closest thing I could think to it, and perhaps it was more impressive because of the opponent, 
was Illinois a five seed in 2004 against Cincinnati, the four seed. And this is the only NCAA tournament game I've ever been to. I had a friend back in high school, and her mom worked for Nancy Cantor, everyone's favorite chancellor. In, in fairness, I don't think that my friend's mom cared too much about Nancy Cantor. So we got these really nice tickets in Columbus. They picked me up that Sunday morning pretty early to get over to Columbus, I think a four-and-a-half-hour drive, something like that. And at Nationwide Arena, we watched Illinois and Cincinnati. I didn't know what to think. I just hoped that they would get a win, but I knew the history. Illinois did not beat better seeds in the NCAA tournament. They had never done that before. Not only did they do that, but they won by like 25 points. Darren Williams scores 31. The game was not really in doubt. Illinois came to play that day. And that's why Saturday was just so freaking awesome because Illinois came to play from the jump. They were taking no chances. They were leaving no doubt. And while Duquesne isn't to the caliber of Cincinnati back in 2004, Duquesne had a top 30 Ken Palm defense until you played them and you knocked them below 30 because you were just so freaking efficient again. They were a scrappy team. That didn't matter. You punked them. Physically punked them. They were going to maybe cause some turnovers, get handsy. Nah, not really. Didn't bother you. They are a very, 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 very light version of what you're going to get with Iowa State. Better athletes on Iowa State. Better offense on Iowa State, though not great necessarily. And the number one defense in the country. But if there is such a thing as a sort of trial run before this very big matchup on Thursday, it felt like Duquesne was probably the better matchup than a BYU. That's a little more, shall we say, finesse. You got the break, you took advantage of it, and you turned some heads in the process. Anyone that watched that game on Saturday thought, damn, <laughs> this is a team putting it all together. Now, that doesn't mean that anything is predestined. It doesn't mean that, hey, we're putting things together, so therefore book that trip to Phoenix. The work that is left to be done this weekend, if you want to make that final four trip and turn this from a very good to elite season, and you know, I would damn near go as far as to say this has been a great year in a lot of different respects, and I, I can delve into that later, and there's an article that I, I have coming out tomorrow. Yes, we're writing articles now. That gets in a little bit to why this might be a great season already. But for an elite Entails. It entails in a uh, Final Four run. UConn in the Elite Eight, that's not going to be elite. Losing to Iowa State, that's not going to get you to elite. We'll remember this season. And I think that it's a harbinger of really good things to come for Illinois and really just a load off, <laughs> importantly. Like, there's the sense of relief, but also the reminder that, yeah, winning NCAA tournament games is a joyous thing. The jubilation that comes from it, the shared joy that you have. Who are you watching it with on Saturday? Were you watching it with friends, family? Where were you watching it? How often did you turn next to the person or to the person next to you and say something along the likes of, this feels really good? And that's what I did with Kenton, who was fantastic on Mike 2 on Saturday. That's what I did with my buddy Kyle. He was in the video in the background wearing that Kofi jersey. And they stuck around for a while afterwards as we had a victory cigar. And we just kept looking at each other like, this feels really good. And it did. I was a little bit hungover on Sunday morning. Got to admit, the Basil Hayden got to me a little bit because I didn't eat a whole lot Saturday because I was admittedly tense just to get this over with and get it done. And then we partied as a, you know, in a relatively healthy way for us late 30s, uh, not so young men anymore. And it was the happiest sort of slight hangover that I could imagine because it, it kept occurring to me on Sunday throughout the day and then even today at school wearing my Kofi jersey and knowing that I'm going to wear Illini crap all week long that this is what it's like to be the fan of a really good basketball program. We already knew that they were. We already knew that Illinois was a very good basketball program historically. But there have been so many things along the way that have sort of dented our confidence in just where we belong and, and where are we at in the pecking order, so to speak. We don't believe we're blue blood. We don't have delusions of that. But I think we believe, and rightly so, that we are a top Big Ten school, top three, top four. And right now you're certifiably top two with a Purdue team that has a decent chance to win a national title. Brad Underwood 
who we're going to talk about specifically after the break here, is the one that engineered this comeback from irrelevance to national relevance. And I will admit that I was not fully correct last year with some of the assumptions I made after the 2023 season had ended in very unceremonious fashion. And here we are today where Brad Underwood's the toast of the town, deservedly so, where Terrence Shannon Jr. is the most dominant player in college basketball, not named Zach Eady. And if you want to say 1A, 1B right now, Terrence Shannon Jr.'s play would make that a fair statement. Where Marcus Damask is clicking. That game against Ohio State in the Big Ten tournament, distant memory. Ever since then, he's been phenomenal in postseason play. There is a momentum that is rising. I hope that it continues through to Saturday. I want that shot against UConn, a game that I think you would win three times out of ten. Not five out of ten, but three times out of ten. That's just how good UConn is. But I want that shot. I think this team can be the team to get you that shot. And oh boy, can you imagine waking up Saturday morning and knowing, all right, hey, what the hell? You got the defending champions in UConn. You got a Red Hot Alani team. Let's roll the dice. But first things first, they have a very, very, very good team in Iowa State that some argued could have been a one seed to get through first. We got a lot to talk about today. We're feeling good. YouTube chat, I'll get to you guys in a bit. Before I get too far into this, I want to remind you, we have an official website now, the 200levelpod.com. That's the 200levelpod.com. It's got the audio podcast. It has our video podcast, and it has a new thing as well. I'm writing articles again. I got my journalism degree. I haven't scratched that itch in a while, so I have a sub stack for the 200 level, and we have the articles linked on the 200levelpod.com. I got another one coming out tomorrow morning, which I'm actually going to Share with you today so you can kind of just see what this writing component looks and sounds like. So the 200levelpod.com, just check it out. Got to thank DP Doe. I'm on at dpdoe.com for all the best deals and prices. dpdoe.com, you are two victory calzones down, hopefully four to go. They deliver anywhere in Champaign-Urbana. So late on Thursday when you've gotten good and liquored up and if Illinois happens to win that game, you want that celebratory calzone that can deliver it to you well into the evening hours, into the early morning hours, in fact, at dpdo.com. Stay from agent Brian Hansen online at brianismyguy.com for life, auto, home, business, renters, you name it. Brian is my guy, and he can be your guy as well at brianismyguy.com. I know Brian's pumped for this, one of the biggest Illini fans I know. Also got to thank Owen Builders LLC. I'm on OwenBuildersLLC.com, a gallery of their work online, home editions, patios, decks. Owen, Owen, Luke Owen, excuse me, he does have a first name, and his staff are excellent at what they do, and the customer service is really what separates them from a lot of other contractors in the area. That's OwenBuildersLLC.com. And finally, got to thank Dogtown Heating, Air, and Plumbing, your home's best friend. Give them a call at 217-841-4728 and get that AC checkup scheduled before it gets too warm. We got a nice warm weekend ahead, it looks like. And before you know it, the 70s will be more consistent. We'll start getting in the 80s. You will want the AC purring like a kitten. Ours does every year because of Dogtown Heating, Air, and Plumbing, your home's best friend at 217-841-4728. Uh, Poor Brothers, we had a great time there for Selection Sunday, and they are a great spot to watch NCAA tournament action all throughout the month of March. That is Poor Brothers in downtown Champaign. All right, also Champaign Showers Podcast Network partnering up, and of course they held the bracket contest as they do each year. Some people doing very well, and honestly, the more scratch you went on your bracket, the better you are likely doing, because Ken Palm, super accurate in terms of the teams left in this tournament and where Ken Palm rankings are. Ken Palm, I think 14 of the 16, I want to make sure I get this right. Sorry, I need to connect back to the internet here. There we go. Okay, back to Ken Palm. So Ken Palm right here, it shows that of the Sweet 16, the only teams in the top 17 on Ken Palm that didn't make the Sweet 16 are Auburn, certifiably shocked by Yale. What a shame, right? Baylor who really kind of careened off the deep end at the end of the year. They were very mediocre at the end of the year. And Michigan State. Three of the top 17 teams on Ken Palm did not make the Sweet 16. 
That means 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 17 are all in it. That's how accurate this thing is as far as predictive analytics. Clemson sitting there at 23rd. Sneaky good team. They make it to the Sweet 16. Thank your lucky stars. They were not the sixth seed in our bracket, and instead it was BYU. And then you have NC State, the outlier, at 53, making a surprise Sweet 16 run after five ones and five days of the ACC tournament. So that is a team that has won seven straight. That means they were 17 and 14, and now they're 24 and 14 in the matter of a week and a half. Now, I mentioned that we have a new written component here for the 200 level. And I, I, like I said, I got my journalism degree way back in the day. I worked at 1071. I never wrote for the Daily Alon. I, I, I don't know why. I just sort of phased out of writing despite the news editorial degree. But listen, I'm, I'm engaged by what I'm seeing on the court, and I just felt like I want to kind of get back to it. And I want to add a new component to the podcast for people that like to read a column, so to speak. I'll try to do this twice a week during football and basketball season and intermittently during the off season. But as I record this on Monday, I have an article ready to go on Tuesday morning that I was going to share with you about Brad Underwood. And the reason I wrote this article about Brad Underwood is because I need to admit that I was wrong in what I predicted might come with future Brad Underwood teams after the way the last season ended. So the article that's going to publish tomorrow on our Substack, which you can subscribe at the 200levelpod.com, is called The Validation of Brad Underwood. After a 2023 season on the brink, Underwood is having his best season yet. Byline, me! I wrote the dang thing. Let me read it to you real quick. I was wrong about Brad Underwood. In March 2023, after Illinois limped their way to the end of the season, I was cynical. It felt like not only had Underwood's proverbial championship window closed, but a toxicity might have seeped into his program. The Ios and Kopis of the world have been replaced with monster energy drink-guzzling doofuses and pouty prima donna freshman point guards. The number of players leaving the program hinted at discontent in the locker room. Gradually, the offseason unfolded with positive results. Justin Harmon, Quincy Guerrier, and Marcus Damas seemed like solid additions that would address roster needs. Terrence Shannon Jr. and Coleman Hawkins returned solidified. This team would not sweat it on the bubble. But I wasn't sold on Underwood yet. Not after Ray J. Dennis chose Baylor after a long courtship by Illinois' deep NIL pockets. Certainly not after Brandon Podjemski was drafted by Golden State in the first round. This, along with the quick departures of Jaden Epps and R.J. Melendez, left me with some questions. We wouldn't suck, but how good would we be? Yes, I had meager expectations for this team. I was grateful for the fact that they were unquestionably tournament caliber. I was leery because the off-the-court drama, roster turnover, and the bitter taste left in our mouths from the 2023 team. I assumed that this would be merely a more likable, yet equally potential-capped Illini squad. It feels so good to have been so very wrong. This season has been Brad Underwood's masterpiece. Consider 28 wins, third most in program history. Big Ten tournament title, yet another banner to hang in the rafters. Number one offense in the country. Yes, even better than 2005. Sweet 16 appearance, first since, you guessed it, 2005. But even more than these tangible accomplishments, Underwood has done something even more impressive. In this relatively new NIL era of college basketball, he's established himself as an elite head coach. Ask yourself, would you trade Brad Underwood for any other Big Ten coach? I wouldn't. Not when he's proven he can identify talent in the portal and land them with relative ease. Not when he lands recruits like Merez Johnson and Jeremiah Fears, and as an Illini fan, you aren't in the least bit surprised. Not when he's willing to make macro adjustments to his scheme in order to maximize talent. Sure, Matt Painter is more accomplished. Objectively, he's a fantastic coach, and there's a decent chance that he's going to get his national title this year. But long term, as college basketball continues to adapt to the new reality of it being a semi-professional league, Underwood is in an elite tier. He continues to win 20-plus games, make tournaments, and compete for conference titles despite inevitable roster turnover. Now he's in a sweet 16, and despite the break of getting Duquesne instead of BYU, there should be some confidence that his teams will make it back again. 
Yes, I'm heaping praise like mashed potatoes on a lunch tray. Perhaps I should take a step back. After all, on February 21st, I titled an episode of the podcast Bad Underwood after Illinois blew a late lead at Penn State. This, 11 days after blowing a late lead at Michigan State. I bemoaned a leaky defense and inevitable early March exit. I could get used to this whole being wrong thing. The existential concerns from a month ago now appear to be mere hiccups in a long basketball season. Brad Underwood and his staff have massaged some of the defensive issues, all while his team continues to cook at a historic pace on offense. They've accomplished big things on the court while scoring recruiting victories off of it, providing Illini fans with short-term excitement and long-term optimism. We view Henson's consistent success in the 80s and the stretch from 1998 to 2006 with three different coaches as the good days of Illini basketball. These are the good days. With Underwood at the helm, the good days may have only just begun. So that article publishing on Tuesday morning on our Substack, which you can subscribe at the two, okay, the 200level.substack.com, or you can subscribe by going to our official website, the 200levelpod.com. I will try not to do any more of that shameless promotion, but it's exciting, right? Now, I'm going to get to the YouTube chat feed and see what some of you guys are saying, but I did ask a question of our listeners today. So the listener mailbag focused on how are you feeling going into the Sweet 16 in Boston, Iowa State on Thursday, along with a poll of what do you think will happen? The three options being lose to Iowa State. That's option one. Option two, beat Iowa State, lose in the Elite Eight. We would assume UConn will make it there. And then the final option being beat Iowa State and then win your Elite Eight game. That's option three. I'll say this is a confident bunch going into this weekend. And honestly, the way you're playing, you should be confident. I would imagine that the team is feeling pretty confident themselves. All right, 12.8% of the 300 plus votes said we will lose to Iowa State. So 12.8%. 56.2% over half said beat Iowa State and lose in the Elite Eight. 31% of you said beat Iowa State, win the Elite Eight. I am probably firmly in that middle camp. I'm confident enough to say, you know what, I think that this matchup against Iowa State actually works out pretty well for this team. If Iowa State were a little bit more balanced, I'd be more concerned. A team that might be able to hang with you if defensively you aren't tight. I'm encouraged by Illinois' defense. I'm encouraged and think that when it comes down to it, if they need to really hunker down, they can do so to the tune of keeping Iowa State to, let's say, 70 points, right? I think that's actually doable. I still think Illinois is going to score points. It's fair to say they won't score 90 against Iowa State, given they're the number one offense. But can they get 75? I think so. I think also because they are not predicated on jump shooting. This is an Iowa State team that would prefer you to actually shoot the three, which is kind of counterintuitive, right? Illinois, for example, tries to run you off the three-point line and make you shoot long twos. What I mean by that with Illinois' offense not being predicated on shooting jump shots is that their first option is not the jump shot. Their first option will be to continue to try to attack the rim, whether it be booty ball with Marcus Damask or Terrence going downhill, or now the new threat of Dane Danger when he's in there getting a quick dump off for Marcus or Terrence or whoever drives the lane themselves. And then if they collapse too heavily, then you have shooters waiting outside. Now, Illinois is not a sharp shooting team, but they are capable of making a decent number of threes. I don't think they're going to change their game plan too much. I think they're going to attack the rim. And then the one variable that I'm really looking at, how is this game officiated? If it's officiated tightly, I think that really favors Illinois. Illinois' defense, no matter how the game is called, tends to avoid foul calls. They aren't overly aggressive, sometimes to a fault, right? So I think that Iowa, being the overly aggressive team, if the officials are calling this thing close, you should feel pretty good about getting to the line a bunch, getting some free points, and getting closer to your average points per game, regardless of what Iowa State's defense has done. Now, that's the heart of me saying, yeah, I think Illinois can win this game. I actually feel like they will win this game. But I would acknowledge that, objectively speaking, it is a coin flip. 
Most NCAA tournament games at this point would be anyway, but Ken Palm has it as a one-point Iowa State win. Bart Torvik has it as a three-and-a-half-point spread in favor of uh, Iowa State, and Vegas has it as two-and-a-half points in favor of Iowa State. These people are not dumb. They know what they're talking about. Vegas knows, as the old adage goes. I don't mind that extra fuel. This is a team that seems to really be kind of on the hunt right now. I'm sure Iowa State is too. Iowa State is extremely tough. They're not going to come in soft in any way, shape, or form. But this Illinois team tends to play better with some sort of edge about them. And that is something I'm encouraged by heading into this game when you're going to need an edge if you want to win. Now, the question that I asked listeners was, what one word best describes how you're feeling as the Illini head into the Sweet 16? Some of these are one-word responses. Some of them are elaborate. Uh, they elaborate on why they chose that one word. So this is from Ethan. Bliss, or maybe simply sweet. We cannot be stopped. We will not be stopped. See what State Farm Center West in Phoenix. Ethan, I'm not going to call you crazy for that. Sometimes you watch a tournament, and you see a team and think, oh, damn. Like, they're on one right now. Funnily enough, if that's a word, funnily, I'm not sure. Funny enough, at the start of the Purdue game yesterday, I thought Utah State was actually giving it to them in the first couple of media, uh, first couple of media timeouts. I think Utah State might have even had a lead. Well, then Purdue ran them, and then the way that they ran them in the second half, I thought, okay, this team is going to the Final Four. No, Tennessee's not stopping them. Not, not at this rate. Purdue needed to knock the dust off, and they did so that first weekend in Indy. They are a freight train. They will make it to Phoenix. I'm pretty confident about that. I wonder how many teams are watching Illinois and saying the same thing. <clears throat> and if they aren't saying the same thing, I think it has less to do with Iowa State and more to do with UConn just being elite. And, yeah, that's a, that's a concern that if you make it to Saturday, you have the best team in the tournament waiting for you. So it is difficult for me, Ethan, to say Final Four, right? It would take your best game of the year, as good as you're playing right now, it would take your best game of the year to beat a team like UConn that is so balanced. But UConn is not undefeated. They have lost three games this year. I think one to a Villanova team, maybe, that wasn't so great. I don't know if they're going to lay a stinker at this point in the tournament, but if you don't get their A-plus game and you give your A-plus game, I just can't count out Illinois' dudes. And I especially can't count out Terrence Shannon, who's playing better than anyone on UConn or anyone on any other team in the tournament right now. Yes, even Zach Eady. I'm not going to say Zach Eady's just doing this because he's tall. He is very good, but he's also seven foot four, and that is a distinct advantage that it's difficult for me to give him quite the same credit as Terrence. All right, so Ethan says bliss. Here's David, and David, I want to make sure that I got. I'm not sure there's a word there, but what David writes is. <clears throat> I think the Iowa State matchup is a coin flip, and I can see it going either way, but I worry about our ability to handle their pressure. As we've seen during the season, that we can get sloppy when other teams dial up the defensive intensity, especially getting the ball up the court. David continues, if the refs blow a tight whistle, that could favor the Illini, get ISU in early foul trouble, and that might help open the game up offensively. If the score stays low, I don't like our chances, but if we have 40-plus by halftime, I don't think ISU has the horses to keep up. But as greedy as I am and won a Final Four, I'm happy with this team's season. They have a banner to lift in the F, uh, State Farm Center and got the program's si Sweet 16 monkey off of its back. Any further win or any further wins are icing. But with the depth of talent on this roster and a superstar in TSJ, a Final Four wouldn't surprise. David, I agree 100%. <clears throat> I, too, am happy with this team's season and... Regardless of what happens Thursday or potentially Saturday, I, I'm not going to change my <clears throat> excuse, excuse me. I'm not going to change my tune on that. I think that this was overwhelmingly a very positive season for Brad Underwood in Illinois basketball, and one that really sets you up long term. Despite losing a ton of production, I think getting that Sweet 16 monkey off the back eliminates any possible negative recruiting that could be done against you. Now, you you are going to continue to put guys in the NBA. Because Terrence will make it. Coleman will make it. And you continue to put banners up in the State Farm Center. <clears throat> and now you can win in March. So what kind of knock is there going to be against Brad Underwood? Additionally, 
I mean, not to make too much of these videos that come out of post games, but the squirt gun thing after Illinois won, that's fun. I'd want to be in that locker room. That seems like a fun place to be. The players right now that he seemed to be able to better identify the players that mesh with him, they seem to be fully on board. There's no murmurs about any of these freshmen transferring, for example. To the contrary, it seems like DGL and Amani Hansberry and <clears throat> Nicolo Moretti are fully in despite not getting a bunch of playing time this year. They seem bought in. These one-year transfers, they seem to buy in very quickly. There is a buy-in that we didn't see last year. And even in years past, you had the Iowas and the Kofis and the Trents and the DeMontes as a through line, but you still had guys like Alan Griffin and Andre Curbelo and and R.J. Melendez and Jaden Epps, and you had a lot of your own recruits leave. It left some questions, but David, I think this season on the whole is already a major success on almost every front, and I agree with you that I'm happy right now. I would be ecstatic, and I am a little bit greedy because it feels like we might have an opportunity here with the way that we're playing, regardless of opponent, but if it ends on Thursday, I'm still going to think, hey, that was a great ride. That was an A season. Uh, A-plus, of course, is making the Final Four. But it's already at an A, I would think. It'd be difficult to give this an A-minus at this point, in my mind. All right, what else we got here? And sorry for the frog in my throat, everybody. I just can't quite seem to get rid of it. From Jacob, Joy, this team is so much fun to watch. I'm on cloud nine right now and just have this feeling something magical could happen this week. I've got the early 2000s vibes of Why Not Us. Jacob, I feel about Thursday's game similar to how I felt in 2001 when Illinois was playing Kansas in the Sweet 16. And they kind of rolled in that game. I don't think Illinois is going to roll against Iowa State because Iowa State is not the kind of team that you easily roll a, roll over just with the way that they play. But I do have this pretty odd sense of confidence going into it that as good as Iowa State is and as the results have shown it, the metrics show it, they just don't have the dudes that you have. I mean, case in point, Kansas and Illinois back in 2001, when Illinois beat Kansas, the next year they did not. Kirk Heinrich, Frank Williams. At that moment, Frank was the dude. Frank was a tougher dude than Kirk Heinrich. You had dudes on the court that could match or better what Kansas had. And that was one of my favorite Illinois NCAA tournament wins, beating Kansas in that Sweet 16. It was from tip to the end. You were just better than they were. And that was a loaded Kansas team, by the way. So I, I agree, Jacob. This takes me back a little bit to the early 2000s. And similar to the early 2000s, of course, I so badly wanted them to get to a Final Four, but I didn't get the sense that they must make the Final Four. It, I was enjoying the ride for what it was at the time, and that's what I'm doing now. I'm enjoying the ride for what it is as we're living it. And... I, I agree, though, that something magical could happen this week. I, I'm not going to discount that. I, I think the way this team's playing, you can't discount that. From Garrett, the word that he used was unencumbered, but still desperately wanting to continue winning. Great word, Garrett. I, too, am unencumbered. I use that exact word texting Isaac and Trevor today. I'm unencumbered. I'm relaxed. Let's see what happens. Easy to say before the game tips off, but I do think that the, the kind of anxiety or tension that I feel Thursday night against Iowa State is going to be simply for the 40 minutes of game and not for some sort of existential, oh my God, if we lose this game, our program is blank. Which is what was in the back of all of our minds on Saturday before the Duquesne game tipped off. Oh, please, for the love of God, don't lose this game. You can't lose this game, right? That That's not quite as fun as just, hey, let's line up, kick some ass, see what happens against a really, really good Iowa State team. So Garrett, I too am unencumbered. It feels good. From Steven, reflective. Let's enjoy the moment for a few more days. I'm going to take the results Thursday as they come, but continue to look at this season as a success. Steven, amen. One of my favorite things about advancing in the NCAA tournament from one weekend to the next is you get the whole week to sit in it and revel in it. To have waited 19 years just to experience that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday of... Oh, yeah, we're going to play again. We're one of the only 16 teams left in this darn thing. I miss that. 
so reflective is good, Stephen. I'm never going to take any of these for granted again. And because you just never know as, as confident as I am that Brad Underwood's going to sustain something here. You, you just can't take anything for granted and assume that it will happen because it's sports. It can turn on a dime. We've seen it ourselves, right? But reflective, Stephen, I am too. And just soaking this all in, wearing all the orange and blue that I can, thinking about Saturday and, and just how fun that was. And knowing that here's the great thing about sports, the shared part of it. Back to who I mentioned in the opening segment. Who did you watch it with? Where did you watch it? You're going to remember that. And yeah, it's Duquesne and, and Duquesne's whatever, but that's still a big deal. You made the Sweet 16 and you kicked their butt doing it. It was never in doubt. It was a top to bottom shellacking in an NCAA tournament game. As my dad said when I was texting him, not too much during the game because not that I believe in jinxes, but I didn't want to count my chickens before they hatched, right? But he made the comment that it was weird having such a stress-free viewing experience for an NCAA tournament game. For a fan base like this that is only stressed come NCAA tournament time, this team afforded us the privilege of not even being stressed on Saturday for hardly a minute. It was 13-6 of the first media timeout. You were up 20 points by the third media timeout. You smoked them. You got a two-hour party before you could party after the final buzzer sounded and have another two-hour party, and then maybe that's why fanboy Carp woke up slightly hungover on Sunday. That's okay. I'm, I was happy to do so. But reflect on it, embrace it, enjoy it. Don't let these next few days go too quick because then, oh, it's game time, and then your only chance of it continuing are beating the next team. All right, from Dave, excited. From Jared, at this point, every team we will play is a great team, but we're also playing great. So I'm hedging my bets by picking middle ground of win or lose, but we'll be optimistic and excited for every game. Jared, that's just it. Every team now is great. I showed you that Ken Palm stat, how it's all the good teams are left. These make for the best tournaments, I think. The early round upsets are fun. Oakland was great. Yale was great. But you know what? It's this weekend coming up when you got the ones and the twos and the threes and the fours. And not much else. And they're going to line up and they're going to duke it out. And by the end of this tournament, more than many of them, you might feel like, oh, well, yeah, you truly got the best team in the nation that ended up with that championship. You know, in years past, there might be that seven or six seed or eight seed or a George Mason, which I know that's an outlier in the final four. And that's fun for the first round or two. It's not as much fun in the Sweet 16 and Elite Eight when, especially in this college basketball environment, we're seeing the cream has risen to the top. And you're one of them. You're a top 10 team according to all the metrics, or at least Ken Palm. You're certainly playing like one, and you are able to now prove that against other top 10 caliber teams. And in the case of an Iowa State borderline top five, I mean, right there, I believe, th according to the NCAA Tournament Committee, they were the worst two seed. Okay, sure. And I think that's how the S-curve works. I th Because UConn's the number one overall seed. But I also think that, um, yeah, it, it, there's something kind of, there's a relief about that, Jared, because you aren't going to lose the Scrubs anymore. Like, if you lose, for example, it's not going to be Loyola. Not that they were Scrubs. It's not going to be some loss that is a blemish. If you lose to Iowa State, you're losing to a team that's capable of winning a national title. If you lose to UConn, it's because you lost to a team capable of winning a national title. And vice versa, if they lose to you, they lost to an Illinois team capable of winning a national title. We can actually say those words. I mean, you're four wins away from it. I don't want to, again, I'm not going to jump ahead, but I, I have thought. <laughs> I would never ask the sports gods for anything else, anything else, if Illinois were to win a national title. I am good. I know it's easy to say that, and then Cubs fans can attest. A couple years later, when you're underperforming in the postseason, it's a bummer. But you know what? It took a hell of a lot of the edge off. I, I really only need one thing as a sports fan for the rest of my life, and that's an Illinois national title. That's the one. That's the big kahuna. 
Not a Bears Super Bowl. That'd be fun, but not like Illinois winning a national title. Yankees World Series, been there, done that. Spoiled in that department. Bulls Championship, eh, fine, sure. That'd be fun, but no, this is it. This is what it's all about. So, Jared, I'm with you on that. Every team that we play from going, this point forward is great. Look at the brackets. I mean, you aren't going to play NC State. So <laughs> they aren't great. They're on a crazy run, but they are not great. And you aren't going to play Clemson. Any team you play will likely be a one or two seed going forward, which is pretty crazy. For Megan, excited. They're clearly having fun out there and are playing up to their capabilities, both of which were lacking during their last tournament appearances. 100%, Megan. I mean, the, the fun part of it, it was lacking. The last three postseasons were this ugh, death march, just uh, joyless experience. And I think the Loyola game informed a lot of that. I don't know if it was joyless against Drexel. I mean, you smoked him, even though it didn't feel, I didn't feel great after that game. And then I knew that probably Loyola was looming and just the narratives annoyed me before that game started. But really from that Loyola game on, these games have been just pull your hair out, really just tense and not pleasant. And then meanwhile, this team, you know, even the first half against Moorhead State where they only were leading by one. Yeah, you know, I can't say that I, I wasn't nervous. I was. You probably were because we had that feeling before of, wait, is this going to be one of those days? Please, God, don't let it be one of those days. But hindsight being 2020, it wasn't really that Illinois played poorly. It was that Moorhead State made a lot of tough shots. They got that 9 nothing lead. I mean, yeah, it scored them by 10 points after that. But that just shows you can't really spot a nine-point lead to an upstart 14 seed that has an upset on their mind and think that you're going to be up double digits at halftime. And then you blitz him in the second half. And then the Duquesne game happens. That's three dominant halves in a row. You know, the competition is about to go way up. But I think there's something about mojo and vibe and feeling good about yourselves and liking the guys that you play with or liking the people that you work with. Essentially, that's what teammates are. You don't have a choice really who you play with in college basketball. And these guys have gelled in a way that we haven't seen from an Illini team in a while. And I would say that, yeah, they probably have this more intangible togetherness than even the Io Kofi team that got the one seed. That team was really good, but an Adam Miller, for example, was a kind of a higher gun in hindsight. <laughs> kind of a higher gun that played shooting guard for you. But was he really entrenched in the culture and all that? And, and Andre Curbelo was Andre Curbelo, for better or worse. There were some fun personalities, but if it feels like with this team, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And there are some really good parts. But the, the whole of it seems to be a group of guys that really enjoys each other. I'm eating all of that up right now. The, the Coleman and company chair thing at post-game conferences where they're coordinating how they push the chairs back in. This is a team that is finding a way to be loose. There was a picture before the Moorhead State game, of Dane Danger and Sincere Harris playing Uno. Now, that is not a big deal, but this is a team that clearly is just hanging out. They know what's at stake, but they aren't letting it snowball into this, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. I, and I, I think the fun part that you mentioned, Megan, it, it had been way too long since we had had that. So it is much appreciated from this team. A few more here. From the Tomahawk, I think best case is beat ISU, lose Elite Eight. Feel like they're playing with house money now, which maybe helps them play even better. I think, Tomahawk, there's something to that. After they beat Moorhead State and look the way they did in the second half, and now they kind of see, oh, wow, there, there's a thing for us. Right here, right now against Duquesne, we win, we go to the Sweet 16. I think now that's becoming more clear what is in front of them, they're more focused. And yet, by the same token, Tomahawk, there's a looseness to the way that they played against Duquesne, despite our tension as a fan base, that I think really bodes well for them going into Boston. I would be surprised if they look tight against Iowa State. I would be surprised. Just going off the last two games and how the Big Ten tournament ended from really the second half of Nebraska on, if you think about it, from the second half of Nebraska on, we could argue that there was one bad half against Moorhead State, but again, was that a bad half or just a little bit off? I don't know if it was bad. They've been engaged fully, I think, ever since that second half in Nebraska. 
All right, from Michael. I think we're too much for Iowa State down the stretch. Nobody is beating UConn. That might be the case, Michael. I mean, this could be one of those, wow, they are just that damn good. And what Hurley has done there is pretty incredible. And they should be favorites to win this thing. They're the most complete team. I know Northwestern was beat up, but UConn looked awesome. I want a chance, right? I just, hey, 40 minutes, let's tip it, see what happens. I want that chance. But, Michael, it's hard to disagree, based on what we've seen this year, that UConn is not the team. From Banana Champagne, I feel good about our chances with Iowa State. However, we would then have to go up against that buzzsaw of UConn, who I have winning the whole thing. You and many others, Banana, and I, I do too. I know it's a safe pick, but sometimes the safe pick is the right pick. From Kevin, confident. Me too, Kevin. At least for Thursday, I'm confident. From Christopher, I feel good about Illinois. Stay on this heater. The team is on. Play good defense. Don't let emotions get in the way. I believe Shannon is on a mission, and Brad hopefully coaches smart. Terrence is, thanks, Christopher, for that. Uh, Terrence is on this thing now where he's tweeting out how many more games are left with a lock emoji. Yeah, the dude is on one right now. And I feel like maybe we haven't talked enough about it because during the live reactions, we're just like, whoa, Terrence is an NBA player amongst college players and some very good college players, but he just stands alone. I know that Lauren Tate wrote an article saying it was the most dominant Illinois season he's ever seen. I know that Jeremy asked Deion Thomas the same thing, and Deion said, oh, yeah, this is the best season. Yeah. How can you disagree? admittedly, Io was only a third-year player, right? So that was the season that a lot of us, when we were living through it, and even the stats would bear it out, was the best overall season by an individual Illini. You look at 89 and 05, those were ensembles that had NBA talent, no doubt. And maybe uh, for different teams, Nick Anderson would have had to take on the role of a Terrence Shannon Jr. Or a Kendall Gill, though I guess kind of in 89-90, Kendall Gill did have to take on that alpha dog role after Nick and Kenny had left. But, you know, while those were ensemble teams and Darren Williams, for example, could have those moments of just taking over a game, Terrence is doing it every single game from the jump. I, I've never seen this. A, a guy just look like he's a middle school, mi middle school kid playing kindergartners at the local basketball court. It's just not fair. And I thought, actually... It wasn't even his best performance against Duquesne. Five turnovers. so a little bit leaky there. And I don't mind that it came against Duquesne because it's at least something that Brad Underwood and the staff can address with them going into the number one defense in the country in Iowa State. You can't be that leaky. You can't let the ball get away from you. I don't think Terrence is going to have five turnovers again. Regardless of the opponent, I, I hope he's like, oh, I had an okay game. But I bet, I bet if you asked him, he would say, yeah, I like some things that I did, but I, I want those back. I, I imagine right now he's just on this weird laser focus thing. And listen, I was on an ESPN radio appearance yesterday and was asked by the host about the Terrence Shannon situation and, and what has it been like to root for him. And I try to answer it as honestly as I could, admitting that it's, it's an icky situation, but you know, I root for Illinois basketball. A federal judge said he's got to play for the team, and – I also need to kind of respect the fact that, you know, the victim has their side of the story. The potential victim has their side of the story, but Terrence has his, and it hasn't played out in court yet. So I'm not going to hold that against somebody when they haven't had their day in court. And the basketball fan in me is watching this guy play and thinking, oh, my God. <laughs> I've never seen this before. And I'm enjoying every minute of that from a sports perspective. And yeah, he wears my team's colors. He's got our name on it. Of course, it's risky. Of course, it's a little bit, huh? Are you sure you want to do that? But you know what? I, I wouldn't begrudge any other fan base for doing the same thing. And from a basketball perspective, it's incredible what we're watching. It really is. And it is the most dominant season I've seen from any Illinois player. Ever. And I've seen some great ones. And this dude's just not single-handedly, because that's not it. I mean, Marcus Damas is doing his thing. Coleman's playing well. You're starting to get Dane Dane just stepping up. Luke Goody playing well. And now Quincy, a really good second-round game. And Ty looking more engaged. Everyone's fi finding their role a little bit better when it matters the most. But, yeah, it's Terrence. Come on. And it only makes the job for, like, a Marcus Damas even easier. It opens up things for everybody. 
And now we're seeing Terrence turn into a distributor, which is what he basically did for the second half of that Duquesne game. Distributing. So, just a little bit of a side there after Christopher's comment. A couple more here from Jalen Galos. Anything is gravy after making the Sweet 16, but Iowa State is going to be a tough match. I think they can pester our ball handling and turn us over. One way to win will be by being stout defensively. Can we rebound and run on missed shots? If so, I like our chances. Me too, Jalen Glows from Wrigley Field, Ivy. Blind confidence, but most likely losing to UConn. Fair. David's word is hungry, David Lucas. G. Gordon Liddy, former staffer for Richard Nixon. Don't know if it's the actual G. Gordon Liddy, but relief. After a Sweet 16 berth and Big Ten tournament championship, anything beyond that is a bonus. Agree, G. Gordon Liddy, objectively, right now this season, I think is an A. It is an A. Can it be an A+. plus? From Eric, now that they finally got the monkey off their back, I can watch without being too anxious. I think we've got a good shot versus Iowa State. But the season is definitely successful regardless of what happens from here on out in my book. Thanks, Eric. From the an- Align Nihilist. Wow, what a name. The Al- Al- Align Nihilist. I'm not a nihilist myself. I, I do think life has meaning. Isn't that the whole thing with nihilism? Life has no meaning, essentially. But this person's word is Terrence Shannon Jr. No space, it's just Terrence Shannon Jr. Yeah, um, he's on one. It's, it's pretty incredible to watch. For Mike Suter, anxious, which is the only one I got for anxious in terms of these responses here. This is from Sweet Lou. Shannon is on a Danny Manning, Glenn Rice type of run. I love Illinois' chances this weekend. I'll say this, Sweet Lou. If you're Iowa State, are you looking forward to Terrence Shannon Jr.? If you're UConn, are you thinking, really? I tell you what, if I'm UConn, <laughs> they got the break with Auburn losing. They, they did. And I think they should beat San Diego State, you know, eight, nine points. San Diego State will hang, I think, but UConn will get the job done. And what's your prize as the number one overall seed? Either the number one defense in Iowa State or the number one offense in Illinois. Now, UConn is balanced enough where they would be favored in either game. But if they play in Illinois, they are playing the hottest player in college basketball. So, yeah, good luck. Uh, (laughs) If I were to say that they haven't faced anyone like Terrence Shannon Jr., well, neither has Iowa State. And neither is San Diego State. And neither is any other team in this tournament not named Purdue. And I guess Tennessee. Marquette as well. But this is different, right? Terrence is just on on a different level right now. I got some YouTube comments I'll get to before we get out of here. It's just nice to talk about a Sweet 16 appearance, isn't it? I mean, it's been way too darn long. And finally, we get to revel in this. And, and I love every, every minute of it. All right, Big Tota, good to see you in there today. From Eric, good to see you as well. Well, and you mentioned that Illinois definitely would have beaten BYU. I have no doubts about that, the way they played Saturday. Also from Eric, I give a lot of credit to Josh Whitman. He's a great AD. We're lucky to have him. I tell you what, Eric, he made the right hire and some with Brad Underwood. And I remember when the name came out, it was the weekend that I think Archie Manning was another name being bandied about. And Whitman went over to Indy, and he watched that Oklahoma State-Michigan game, which was a great NCAA tournament game. Juwan Evans almost single-handedly carried Oklahoma State to victory. And he got the job done, got Brad Underwood that weekend after just one season at Oklahoma State. And I thought, well, that's an interesting hire. And I like what he did Stephen F. Austin. And he had a good first year at Oklahoma State after a rough start. But I couldn't have predicted this. I mean, it, it was like with any coaching hire, can you make tournaments and can you compete in the Big Ten? Let's start there. He's went beyond that, and as the article I shared earlier with all of you, and it'll be up on our Substack tomorrow, that's that's really, it's extremely impressive. This coming from someone that was a little bit skeptical after the way last season ended. From David Lucas, who also tweeted as, Terrence is on a mission. It certainly appears that way, David. From Mark, this team is on another, another level when Coleman is hitting his threes. Mark, those things didn't hit the rim. It was like the the hoop was rimless when Coleman made those three threes. And that was, I maybe it was the second one, but definitely by the third, it was like, oh, we're winning this game. It's, it's, it's game over. You knew it. All right, from Brad P. I may be wrong, but I think UConn has to beat all teams they played in the tournament by 10 or more points in the last two years. I think you might be right, Brad. 
I have to go back on Ken Palm and check that, but I, I don't think there's been really any close games for them. And from World 964, as a season ticket holder in the 89-90 season, I can tell you the Kendall Gill-led team was nowhere as dominant and as exciting as this year's team. Thanks, Jay. Jay from Pennsylvania. Yeah, if anything, having talked to my dad about that team, I was too young to remember it. That team was frustrating, it sounds like. It was Gill and Bardo returning from the Final Four team. And it just seemed like from accounts, whether it be from my dad, from having observed it, or, or from articles back in the day, the vibe was not great on that team. They won a lot of games, but they weren't really a threat to make a deep run. Something was amiss. From On The Mark, I believe the biggest game in our recent history was the whooping by Baylor against us in Indy. They were long at every position, and it seemed like it stuck with Brad. Definitely, Mark. And there's an article on The Athletic, which I don't have access to. I'm not a subscriber, but apparently it delves into how Brad, after losing as a one seed, decided I need to go about roster construction differently. And he's very much done that. And then on top of that, I guess in this article, it, it mentions a conversation he had with Jay Wright in December of this year that helped lead to that offense getting even better. The number one offense in the country. Don't forget that. All right, everybody. We got a sweet 16 game to play. When you do a podcast like this, this is what you hope for, that you can talk about big games. Here's the plan for this weekend. Thursday night, we will be in the garage, okay? It's been great to us. I've done the Iowa game out there. I did the three, two of the three Big Ten games. We've done both NCAA tournament games. I watched the game at Wisconsin on March 1st. So since my March 1st, the garage has been my viewing place other than Poor Brothers, and we still won that game. We're sticking in the garage, all right? We're going to do that. It's going to be me and Isaac. I think Kent will be by two on third mic, and I think a few other friends of mine coming over. So we have a little peanut gallery in the background. It is a late night. We don't have school Friday. Now, Friday, win or lose, I'm going to Michigan. We're uh, spending Easter with Kara's family up there. If we win, <clears throat> I'll have my stuff with me. And if there's a game Saturday, I will figure out a place to do a live reaction pod during the second half. We'll get it done. We'll make sure that we are reacting. Yeah, I, I'll miss being in the garage, but you know, when you get to a game like that, the possibility of making a Final Four, I'm just going to find a place I think it, I believe will be at her uh my sister-in-law's house up there. I'm just going to find a nook where it's just me and a TV. Alone. Solitude. Focus. Laser focus. That's the kind of stuff where you can say, oh, there's no pressure, this, that, and the other. And in a way, there's not. But there's also the, oh, my God, we go to the Final Four if we win this thing. Just one good game. Come on. Your best game of the year right here, right now. And would that be enough against UConn? I think it could be, right? I want that chance. I do. And I guess since I won't be talking to you again until Thursday evening, we're going to have an article come out tomorrow. We're going to have an article come out Thursday. I'm in the writing mode right now. But since I won't talk to you until Thursday, here's what I do think will happen. I do think Illinois beats Iowa State on Thursday in a really high-level game. Think like Big Ten tournament on steroids just because the stakes involved here. Why do I think Illinois is going to win? I don't need to give you much analysis other than Terrence Shannon Jr. Yes, I think Marcus Damask against this Iowa State team, that will be what I'm interested in the most perhaps because if he can have a good game against this defense, I think you're winning. If he has an Ohio State Big Ten tournament type game, it's a little dicey to say the least. But Terrence, I know, is going to get his because I would agree with everyone that said this in here. Dude's on a mission, whether it's the perceived slight of not getting first-team All-American, only getting third, whatever it may be, he is on one. And I think that sometimes, if you really simplify it, this time of the year in this single elimination tournament, who's got the dudes? And in this case, who has the alpha dude? It's Illinois, unquestionably, has the best player on the court. I understand why Vegas is going with that two-and-a-half-point spread. On one hand... On the other hand, I don't. I think that will move closer to Illinois and not the other way around as we get closer to it. So I do predict Illinois will be playing on Saturday. I can't predict that they're going to beat UConn or, small chance, San Diego State. 
I'd love to get a break from that, and we'll know before our game tips off if it's UConn or San Diego State. But I want that chance, and I think we'll get it. And then let's just see what happens. But you got an Illinois team on a roll. You got an Illinois team that has already had tangible success this year and has made this a season that we'll talk about. The question is, will we talk about this along the lines of 01? Really good team that made the Elite Eight. Or are we going to talk about this along the lines of 89 or 05? And to me, the fun part of this is in 89 and 05, you were one seed caliber the entire season. And with that comes some weight and responsibility. Don't blow it, guys. You're a one seed. You got to make the Final Four. This kind of team making a Final Four run would be a first for me as an Illini fan and really for you as Illini fans, no matter how old you are. Anytime we've made that Final Four run, it's been the team. No, this team, less than a month ago, or just over a month ago, blew a seven-point lead late at Penn State. Were any of us feeling good at that point? No. Terrible defense. What the heck's going on? Or We're going to lose early in March. That was my thought. Well, they're cresting. And they're cresting when it matters the most. So let's see what happens. And uh, it begins Thursday night. So we'll see you in the garage. Me, Isaac, I believe Kenton, some other people. For those that are in the YouTube feed, thank you for joining me on a Thursday afternoon. If you guys can just subscribe on your way out and just hit that thumbs up button to like the video, it helps us get discovered by other people. We've had a decent number of new subscribers this month, getting closer to 400. Uh, the views are going up as Illinois continues to march into the postseason. All right, got to thank all of you for listening and watching. Remember, we got an article that's publishing Thursday morning. You can access that on the 200levelpod.com, our official website. And the article itself is in our Substack. That's the 200level.substack.com. Got to thank DP Doe online at dpdoe.com for all the best deals and prices, dpdoe.com. Stay Farm agent Brian Hansen online at brianismyguy.com. Dogtown Heating, Air, and Plumbing, your home's best friend at 217-841-4728. And Owen Builders LLC online at owenbuildersllc.com for all your home additions, patios, decks, and those projects. Got to thank Poor Brothers, great place to watch the games, for having hosted us on Selection Sunday and the Champagne Showers Podcast Network. Thank you all again for tuning in on this random time on a uh, Monday afternoon, and we'll see you Thursday night out in the garage, Illinois, Iowa State, for a chance to go to the Elite Eight. It is the 200 level. All right, got it saved. Thank you. All right, thanks, everybody, again. On your way out, subscribe, like us, and the200levelpod.com. Check out that website. It's a one-stop shop for the audio, the video, and now the written stuff. And, I, hey, if you got a few minutes, read those columns. I'm enjoying writing again, and I hope you enjoy reading them as well. See you guys Thursday from the garage.